Uh, I was just saying to Peter before, I almost feel like a bit of a fraud. I've, uh, this is more of a story that starts in 1992 uh, up until today, and it's a little bit about the future. Um, I don't actually sell probably anywhere near as much in terms of revenue as a lot of you guys on Amazon, but I just want to share my story and I hope that uh, you like it. It's probably more of a story about not what to do. <laughs> so my invention really came out of a need, and I guess a lot of people that invent things, uh, you know, um, usually it's because they have their own need. And mine was basically that I was working for a pre-press company way back in 1992. So I was um, basically I, I was a cartographer by trade, which is does anybody here know what a cartographer is or what a cartographer does? Maps. Maps. Well done. So. I, and my father and my brother are actually engineers, so, and they, were, they ran a factory, um, and I used to work there on my summer holidays, and they cut shapes out of foam, a die-cut factory, basically. And a lot of the foam that they were using and, and cutting shapes out of was for the automotive industry, so they, they had foam that blocked a little bit of sound, so, you know, against firewalls of cars and inside, you know, car interiors, that sort of stuff. I used to hate my summers. And... Um, so anyway, what happened was I rang my brother because I was living on a busy main road. I was working from 10 o'clock at night until 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, four days a week. So I was doing 40 hours of worth of work uh, in the middle of the night in a factory all by myself. And it was, it was really hard to sleep during the day. So basically what I did was I rang my brother Mick and I said, hey Mick, can you send me some, you know, some acoustic foam that blocks a bit of sound? I'm just going to create like a little headband and I'm going to jam these little bits of foam up underneath this band against my ears because I, I was having problems with earplugs. And um, so anyway, then I stopped working night shifts, so I chucked away the product. Oh, actually, at the time, I was also um, living with a friend of mine called Tammy Lee, who was a policewoman, so she was working night shift too, and so she asked if I could make one for her, and I've always had a thing for Tammy Lee. Anyway, <laughs> just who wouldn't with that name? She was stunning. Anyway, so anyway, up, fast forward to 1999, and I was actually working uh, at this stage at Lonely Planet as a cartographer, so I got the travel bug. And I just met my, well, a girlfriend who's now my wife. Tammy Lee was gone by this stage, and um, and we were so we went travelling, and we got to Asia after three months in Europe. We did three months in in uh, in Asia, and of course there's roosters and chickens, and you know you're in Cambodia or whatever. It's just really noisy first thing in the morning. I was like, oh, damn it, I should have brought my thing. But the internet was really starting to get going. There's a lot of buzz about the internet and e-commerce was starting to you know get going. So I was pretty excited. And I was thinking, look, when I get back to Australia, I'm going to just quit Lonely Planet and I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to start a business. So I sold my house, um, raised about 45000 Australian dollars by, from that sale uh, and commercialised the hub mate. So anyway, it took about a year, found, us, you know, found us, uh, a lady that was prepared to help me. It was very hard to actually find a seamstress um, who was prepared to manufacture a small quantity of just this one thing just to see if it would even work. So, and... This is no kidding. I launched the business on September the 11th of 2001, and I don't know if you guys know. And I was, and in, in Australia that night, the planes were flying in at around about nine o'clock or ten o'clock at night into those towers, and I was a little bit, you know, I might have had a couple of drinks or something, but you know, it was just, oh my God, what is going to happen um, to my business? Or what's going to happen to you know all these people? It's just, it was terrible, and it was just sort of one of those really sort of yay moments, and then just you know, what the hell's going to happen next? Lonely Planet was in trouble. The company that I uh, actually was, at this stage, it actually had to go back to work. So anyway, it started pretty slow, uh, the business, because I didn't know anything about the internet or even how to market on the internet. Uh, but luckily, I found this fantastic book by this guy called Ken Evoy, which was called, this is 2001, he'd written a book called Make Your Site Sell 2002. That was like the future. <laughs> and it was really cool. So I bought this book, it was about 40 bucks Canadian, he was a Canadian MD, but he wrote this great book about, have, uh, with three, three sort of sections to it. First of all, have a great product. And I was pretty happy with the product that I had. Number two, get targeted traffic to your website. You can use PPC, at the time there were things like Overture, which became Yahoo Search, Search Marketing, and now it's Panama or whatever it is now, Bing I think, and, um, and SEO of course. And the last bit was, have a website that converts. And in our case, we've got Amazon listings that's kind of creating really great copy, you know, using words like, you will love this product, you, you and your friends, you know, you, and it's really having a conversation with someone. So there's a lot about copywriting, building trust, credibility, likability in your copy, real conversational stuff. And within a few months, now that I'd sort of figured out how Google worked, I'd actually risen to the top of Google. And I was the world's number one ranking 
If you typed in sleep mask, eye mask, sleeping mask, anything to do with my product, I was pretty much in the top three in the Google results. Amazon didn't even exist about what did, but it wasn't, you know, they didn't have the PL stuff going on. So, but it was very part-time. The business was doing about $120,000 a year, maybe a profit of about sort of 30, 40,000 bucks a year. So, and I, and, but what this did was it got me into, I was able to switch careers and I actually ended up working into search marketing, which was great. And I ran this very, you know, I had a very high powered job running this company. But while all this was going on, social media started. Now in the past, when I started, you could basically just push out whatever bloody message you wanted to uh, about how great you were and how great your product was, but you started getting things like YouTube. Now the problem with the product, here it is here, is that it uses, this is actually probably the, the second last remaining version of the original that you saw before, which I brought to Hong Kong because I'm going to bring it back to market. Um, because everybody, all my old customers from 2001 through to 2013 are like, oh, what, what, what did you get rid of this for? I was like, oh, okay, okay, we'll bring it back. But basically what it had was these little bits of foam inside and they didn't block sound very well. So you get these students that are living in dorms going, this product sucks, you know, what? So I was like, I had to do something. I had to fix it. So because of my job, I used to use Google a lot. And one day I typed in the key phrase earmuffs. And Google had just released Google Suggest, which is this stuff that people are actually typing in. And Google's telling you, you may also like stuff. You know, Amazon's got it too. But what you can see, how does my pointer work? This guy, down here. So this happened about 2009, 10. I can't exactly remember the day. And wait, basically all the results, when you clicked earmuffs for sleeping, were all about earplugs. So I'm like going, huh? So no one's actually made earmuffs for sleeping? Really? So the next step to validate what the, well, okay, how many people are typing in earmuffs for sleeping? How big is this market with no one actually servicing them with anything? So I use this thing called Google AdWords, which you guys might have heard of. Now, this says earmuffs for sleeping, and it's an exact match key phrase. Anybody here using PPC on, on Amazon? It's pay per click, yeah, and you can, now you've got phrase and exact and broad and all that sort of stuff. Well, exact match key phrases in the SEO world, we used to use AdWords a lot using exact match key phrases to find out keyword volume. You can use the keyword planner and all this other stuff, but this is the real world how to, to you know, assess demand on keywords. On top of that, this is over from about 2010 through to about 2000 and maybe 15, I think, this sort of period here. I was actually started right at the beginning back in 2002 on AdWords, so it was very powerful. What well, you can see in that sort of period, there was up here, we've got almost 900,000 instances of earmuffs for sleeping, sleeping earmuffs, and all these different key phrases over that sort of period. There's about 250,000 people a year on Google, let alone Amazon or anything else, actually looking for this product. Guess who sells it? Well, guess who wanted to sell it? It was me. Over here, you've sort of got like a you know, cost per conversion. So over here, it's like $6 per conversion. I actually ran an ad, a Google ad, basically said, looking for earmuffs for sleeping? I've got the next best thing. And my, I started selling heaps of these because of the ads that I was running. So I already knew that there was demand and there was a real opportunity here. All I had to do was make it. So demand's good. Next step, let's get a patent search underway. I wanted to make sure if I'm going to make this thing, am I going to be infringing on anybody else's patent and get myself into a whole world of pain? So I didn't want to do that. So what I did was I spent 4,000 bucks with a, a company in Australia called Actuate IP and they did a search and basically we got the all clear. There was a few possible sort of problems, but it was generally it looked look pretty, pretty much like everything was going to be okay. So that, that was at that point I went, okay, I'm going ahead. I'm going to invest all the profit from the existing product and everything I've got, and I'm going to invest, invest it into this project. So I selected a design firm. Now, luckily for me, I had a friend of mine called Abigail Forsyth who makes the Keep Cup. Now, this is huge in Australia. I don't know how big it is in in America or where are you guys, does anybody know what the Keep Cup is? Maybe one, two, possibly, okay. So basically it's a reusable barista coffee cup uh, and you know she ran a, she had a, she's now like uber rich, this thing's selling all over the place, it's just going great, there's a lot of copycats as well but I rang her and I said, hey Abby, what was, what was Cobalt Niche like to work with? She said they were great, they're slow but they're good. So I said, okay, well let's, let's try them out. So I commissioned them the brief was really easy. It was actually, in fact, an A4 sheet of paper with one sentence on the top. Just said, I want you to make me soft earmuffs for sleeping. It's something I can sleep with. And they're like, okay, we'll try our best. So what happened was that we, you know, if you saw the sketches before, 
this was kind of the first step. It was a little bit like Ben's project. So you're kind of coming in and they're kind of doing little presentations in their office and they're saying, you know, these are sort of the directions we're thinking about taking, what do you think? I was like, oh, I prefer to have like a single band rather than these sort of dual bands, this sort of approach that they'll take. Oh, we don't want to do that. We want to put, a, put your logo actually on the cups so that people can see it when they're in an airplane or whatever and you can kind of, you know. I was like, all right, well, let's go with a dual band. So keep going going forwards. Um, so around about 12,000 bucks, there's a few rounds of prototyping and about 12 months later, I ended up with my very first prototype. It, was, uh, it looked great. It blocked a reasonable amount of sound. It was made out of a, a you know, polyurethane. But if I, eventually, we were actually going to go to silicon. Like a medical grade silicon was kind of soft. That caused some problems down the track, as you'll see when I get to Kickstarter. Anyway, so all the costings were done. Now it was time for Kickstarter, because I wanted to get, raise some money, because I'd spent a lot of money actually just sort of getting to the point where it was, like, you know, I had a prototype, but that I needed a lot more money to make an actual product. So then we filed for the provisional patent applications. There's another sort of four grand on top. All right. Um, where are we up to? So yeah, Kickstarter was basically what we wanted. To, what I wanted to do there was, you know, absolutely to make sure that there was some demand for the product. As you know, as I mentioned in the slide, you guys can read a lot faster than I can talk, by the way, because you probably. How many of you have already read that entire slide? Yeah. So. Um, but it's got other benefits as well. As Ben talked about, it's pretty quick. You can build a brand, provided that you do a good job with your Kickstarter project. It is a real double-edged sword. You can raise a lot of money, but short to uh, long term, you can actually really shoot yourself in the foot, as I discovered. So this was the project page. You can all go and have a look at it some, you know, when you've got nothing better to do. But basically, what I did was, um, was that I spent a lot of time looking at other successful projects uh, you know, everything from like the camera capture clip with Peter Derham. You know, he, he started his, his Kickstarter video with uh, something like, um, you know, I, I, I really excited about, uh, you know, uh, really excited about, I want to share the, you know, sort of this secret project that I've been working on for the last 18 months. I can't wait to, you know, to show it to you today, sort of stuff. So I kind of stole a lot of those lines to kind of create um, as compelling a, a Kickstarter video as I could. The other thing too that I knew was that I'm almost 50, I've got no hair, I'm not particularly good looking. All right? And then on Kickstarter, you got a lot of young kids who got credit cards and stuff. Uh, so, so as you can see in the image back here, this is my friend Dylan, he's American, he's young, he's incredibly good looking. <laughs> so my wife says. So anyway, <laughs> just stop it. Anyway, so basically what happened was that we, so I, I offered him 2% of whatever we raised. But don't tell anybody I told you, all right? So, but anyway, that was so, so over the 110 or so, he ended up with about 22 or 2300 bucks. And he helped me all the way through the actual fulfillment and all the, you know, the communications that we did with our backers as well. He was an absolute superstar, still a really good friend of mine. Got a lot of time for Dylan. He was great. But uh, that, that also really helped connect with that, that Kickstarter audience. The other issue that we had too was that we weren't really doing any kind of techie and sort of edgy like, a, like the fishbone. You know, ours was a very pr passive product, so we actually had no idea how it was going to go. Anyway. So you can see here, we did, we spent a lot, obviously you've got a bit of upfront cost when you're doing a Kickstarter campaign, you've got to do a video, you've got to, you know, there's a lot of time involved as well. You know, I was working full time, I'm running this thing, very high powered job, uh, you know, and you're trying to, and running this, still trying to run this thing, you know, with the other, and fulfilling it out of your own house, you know, shipping out of, you know, maybe 10 to 15 orders a day off the website. So there's a lot going on. Uh, now, just to sort of get the launch going as well, I had about six, uh, five, six hundred people that I was, you know, who'd sort of emailed me back saying, this thing doesn't block enough sound. So I was like, hey, guess what? I've got something coming up. So, you know, I added, I was starting to create like a separate list so that when I went live, I was able to go, kapow, it's live, you can get it. It's early bird specials, getting quick. So, um, yeah, and that, that was the other thing, of course, was that, yeah, using the pledges to um, the, those early birds to actually get you to the sort of nominal target. Now, I said a nominal target. I needed about 100. I said about 10K. I wanted to hit that target, and I wanted to just really get the whole show underway. I remember when we pushed the live button, me and Dylan were sitting in a cafe in Melbourne. I pushed the button to go live on the campaign. On the way home, I was driving home, and I hit a set of traffic lights. This is seriously about six or seven minutes after we'd gone live. My first set of lights, I stopped refreshed the page, and we'd already had about three pledges. I was like, oh my god. The next morning, me and Dylan met up. This is now um, around about sort of 14 to 15 hours after the night before. 
we were already at about 8,000 bucks and we were just well on the way to hitting our 10 grand target and, there was all, and, and all hell broke loose. We were getting emails and messages and there's a lot going on, comments and it's a very, very intense period of your life as Ben would probably attest to. Um, but a lot of fun. So this is the final kind of graph from a, a website called Kick, Kick Track. T-R-A-Q. Um, and what you see here is like on day one, basically you know, our 10 grand target was smashed. And then it just sort of ticks along, doing about $3,500 a day. And then uh, right at the end, you get this, this quite a nice little spike as well. And we eventually finished up with about 110, which is pretty good. So now it's time to manufacture. Now before, once we at the prototype stage, um, I'd actually got all the costings out of, the, out, of my, out of my suppliers. And all of my suppliers, every single one of them was actually a source from Australia. But basically they were third party agents that had factories in China to build stuff. So a little bit of um, cost, I haven't actually broken down the exact cost of all the different components, other than to say the silicon ear cups, very expensive, about four or five, $4.50 US a pair. So that's one of the reasons why we're switching again, we're going back to polyurethane, which actually blocks more sound, I think, than silicon anyway. So um, the, other, the other issues that we, oh, we had a bit of local packaging, we sort of designed it ourselves using another crowdfunding campaign for some designing. Um, we used a sheltered workshop for assembly. That caused a bunch of problems as well as we're trying to do the right thing, but yeah. Um, Australia Post was basically doing airmail shipments for us. If you've ever seen like 3,000 units, because a lot of my backers ordered more than one, you know, just, just sitting in, a, in your living room, man, it is just a sea of... <sighs> um, anyway, so yeah, we delivered. We actually we was trying to deliver. We'd finished in, what, I, uh, J July. We were trying to deliver by October. It was just ridiculous to even try and do that, uh, given what we were trying to do. Um, uh, so yeah, we ended up with, uh, delivering a few months late. But by Kickstarter standards, that wasn't too bad. And the fish feedback was great. Like we actually, you know, thank you so much, I've made this is a great product, you know, blah, blah. And then all, all hell broke loose. And a few people started saying, well, actually, I can still hear stuff. Now, you guys probably can't read that, but very poor product. Fell apart after a few weeks. No sound insulation. Poor. Uh, poor, poor fitting ripped off. And this is a, almost a, a, an endless list of, uh, there's probably about 70 backers, out of the two and a half, two and a half thousand or thereabouts, backers that basically just went to town and got stuck into us. It was a little bit half-baked, I don't know if you can read this one, waste of money, very bulky, zero sound reduction, low quality, I wouldn't pay $15, product was half-baked. Probably about right, actually. <laughs> so. Never received my reward. Wish you bad cancer, Danny. I think this one, you know, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> These people, they will eat their own children. Seriously, they just. So anyway, we would basically gone from yeehaw to wow, I've got a big problem here. I've got a big problem with the brand reputation right now. I've got a big problem with the product. I absolutely agree. The product, all right, it was, it was, you know, this is the thing about Kickstarter is that what you're trying to do is, uh, you know, it is to support a business in its effort to try and bring something to market that will change people's lives for the better. And I actually, seriously, I, uh, at, you know, during this period uh, of December, we were already starting to move to Hong Kong because my wife had taken a job with a large telecommunications company here in Hong Kong for two years. So I was moving kids, I was moving business, I was moving myself, I was getting out of my, my high-powered job, I was handing over to another person. Kickstarter feedback like this wasn't really helping and I basically came very, very close to having a nervous breakdown about the whole situation. I'm not kidding. It was actually, for my mental health, it was probably the, the wobbliest that I'd ever, I've ever been. Like, you know, normally pretty, pretty you know, solid, but this was, this really knocked me in the guts. So, anyway, we got back to Hong Kong, got settled, got my shit together, and then basically went, right, I'm going to fix it now. So, 2014. So, I spent all of 2014 finding new supplies. Now the way that I did this was I, I went to uh, a competing uh, trade show here in, in Hong Kong. I've forgotten the name. Anyway. And, um, and I was walking up and down the rows, up and down after I dropped the kids off at school. Literally went from school to the trade show. And I was walking up and down the rows and I saw, it was just one of those things where I just saw this guy, he was a Western guy in a booth and he had some silicon products. So that was kind of like what I was using for my product. And he was a product designer. And you know, some people call us inventors. We like to call ourselves developers and designers. Anyway, so I went and had a chat to him. 
And he sort of said, oh, he looked at the, you know, the current version of the product and he just went, yeah, look, you know, it's too thin here and you need to thicken this out a bit and I can help you and introduce you to some people. And the next thing I know, I was just finding really, really established and trusted suppliers uh, who were able to um, not only drive down the cost, but also improve the quality of packaging and everything started to come together. And so in January 2015, I was able, you know, this time, no, January last year, um, I launched this thing. Now, when I, did the, when I launched the Kickstarter project, I'll just go back one step. When I launched the Kickstarter project, the amazing selling machine launched its very first edition in July of 2013. And I desperately wanted to do it, but I was just too busy to, you know, to get involved with that. Uh, you know, what I was hoping was that we'd run the Kickstarter project and then I'd be able to go and start selling on Amazon straight away. But clearly I couldn't do that with the kind of product that I had based on the Kickstarter feedback. So I, I had to delay everything another year to fix the product and re-release it. The initial feedback was really good, on, you know, good enough. It was a four star out of five star kind of feeling you know, and, and feedback. So that meant then that I was really feeling like I was ready for Amazon. So actually I was kind of skipped ahead, didn't I? But anyway, so, the, so by, and now I was sort of dealing with uh, like really great suppliers, you know, Raymond at Yawa. Yawa's awesome. If you want to get a product assembled or, or anything like that and you need it sort of prepped properly for Amazon, it, these guys are just fantastic. The other thing I did too was I made sure that all my different suppliers were shipping all the different components to, to one place, which, which I had a very strong commercial agreement with, with Yawa, so that none of the suppliers, you know, the ear cups were coming here, from here, the ear cushions that go inside the ear cups were coming from another factory, the masks were coming from somewhere else, and basically I didn't want any of these guys to know how this whole thing hung together. Um, Yao was the only company in China that knew exactly how it all worked, and we had, a, we had an agreement to make sure that, you know, they weren't going to make a bunch more and sell them. So we got into Amazon, three warehouses, everything done beautifully, and then I launched on the 3rd of March, 2015. So this is a, I'm a year in, or just over a year, right? Um, so anyway, it's going good, we're making some money. Uh, you know, I'm probably doing uh, maybe $1,200, $1,300 a day, I'm pretty happy with that one product. Um, and then I lost some money, a lot of it. Disaster, the Amazon checkbox of death. Who's fallen for this one? <laughs> Yay, there's one person who's happy to put their hand up. There's a lot of others. When I blogged about this, oh man, so many people came and spoke to me, sent me an email saying, oh, I lost all my inventory. And anyway, <sighs> how much detail do we get in here and how am I going for time? I'm probably about halfway through the deck. Anyway, so just watch this button and please don't tick it if you don't know what you're doing. Basically, what happened was, is this. This customer had said, oh, I've just ordered your product on Amazon. Uh, you know, I ordered it for my girlfriend, but I accidentally ordered a black one. Could you send me a pink one? Or can I, you know? And I was like, yeah, dude, look, I'm just starting out on Amazon. It'd be great if you could leave an unbiased and sort of hopefully, you know, favorable review on the current product. I'll ship you one for free. Here's a coupon code. Anyway, this group of Koreans, expat sort of student Koreans that were living in, a, in America, got their grubby hands on it, not only because it was probably showing on the product page, don't fall for that one, but anyway, it got shared in a heartbeat. And this was on Thursday night, the night before Good Friday. So it's a really crappy time to be starting to get in touch with Amazon when everybody's starting to go on holidays at Amazon. So in one hour, $42,000 worth of stock was wiped out, 700 units. Actually, they'd actually bought every single unit that I had. Over 1,200 units that were in stock. I managed to save about three or 400 units, or Amazon did. But that whole, from Friday to Saturday, I sat there helplessly watching those kind of spam-like emails. Congratulations, Amazon has just shipped another product you sold. <laughs> yeah. For frickin' free. <laughs> Fantastic. So that's, that's what it looks like. So that, that really... That's kind of like ripping your heart out and eating it for pleasure, you know, it's just... So I needed more stock, and by now I'd lost all this sort of profit that I'd be counting on, so they'd kind of dip back into the, you know, some, some money. Anyway, while all that was going on, I'd already commissioned for this second product to go live on Amazon, which was sort of what I thought would be a really nice little complimentary product. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but geez, this was a stupid idea. This was like super competitive, you know, just... What was I thinking? You know, I gave away like, you know, I've probably about a hundred of these things. I'd ordered about a thousand of them or something. And now I've still got about three, four hundred of them, you know, I'm sitting. Can't sell them. I mean, I couldn't give them away. But basically what I've got now is I'm just doing them at cost. It's one of those great things about when you've got products at Amazon, 
Yeah, just sell them out at cost. You just get your money back on what you invested in it and then move on to the, product, the next product, right? Anyway, so, so that's a disaster, that other one, right? The, the neck pillow thing. So I'm like, all right, look, let's just go back to what I'm reasonably good at, which is sort of developing products and kind of, you know, getting them to market. And, and that's probably what I really, because you've got to make this fun, you know? I don't want to sort of just take some bloody thing and stick my own logo on it and throw it on Amazon. I mean, look, at, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's great if you want, you know, but. So I found this amazing supplier, Linda, who is here. Put your hand up. And so Linda and I have been working for the last probably, what, eight, nine months? And we've been, so I basically did a bit of research and I was going, okay, I want to get into the sleeping headphones market. Um, so what I did, and, uh, and uh, I think Ben has already talked about this, but basically I went through all, you know, typed in that keyword, got all the products, and basically just went through them all, one and two stars, what is wrong with all these products? Now there's a lot of problems with these products. They're all unreliable. And people tell you, 10 reasons not to buy these headphones. <laughs> Bring it. It's like, thank you. So, I mean, you're just, just like, it's, it's just amazing, it's thank you, it's like free. So, so Linda and I sit down with our team and we go, right, what are we gonna do? We gotta fix, these are the three top problems with these products, you know, they're uncomfortable when you sleep on your side or they're, you know, anyway. So, we think we've fixed those problems, and this has been manufactured as we speak. I paid Linda the down payment of 30% just the other day. So that process though, sort of looks like this, and Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, I was kind of a bit of a rush as I was putting this slide together, but we basically, we've had a, a few rounds of prototyping. Uh, you know, we, we've, shot, we've had a photo shoot in Shenzhen with the model that you saw in the previous shot. She was from Russia. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, anyway, my, my sort of philosophy as well was that, Look, Amazon's getting more competitive. Uh, you, know, there's, you know, everybody knows that. I, I, I'm just trying to create something a little bit more long term, uh, and I want to create products that you know, you know, really stand out, that are truly my own, um, you know, and, and basically create a long term business. And no one's really talked about this yet, but I think also try and create a long term brand with a really good, solid set of quality products that nobody else has got. Does that make sense? It's a lot, it takes a lot longer, it's a lot more expensive, but I think and I hope with my strategy that is, as it's playing out at the moment is going to create a lot more long-term value. It also enables you to, you know, you've got a lot of eggs in one basket on Amazon. You're kind of renting a spot there and they can boot you off as you're about to find out. So this is what the, the category looks like. It's kind of classic Greg Mercer stuff. We've got a lot of, review, a lot of volume. Uh, we have in the top 10, quite a lot of sellers, less than 10, 100 reviews, uh, and some pr reasonably good revenue, sort of 16, 34,000, 55, 36, 30, et cetera. So I think if I can capture, in that whole category we're talking around about, it's about 350,000 US dollars a month. If I can capture, you know, maybe sort of 10% of that, I'll be pretty happy with this new product. So there's good demands, good revenue, um, you know, and I'm hoping I've got the best product in the category. We'll soon find out. Depends on what the customers say. Um, and then obviously what that does too is when you start off with like a, a premium wide version, then you can potentially start to create exactly the same kind of product, but this time now you can go into Bluetooth. Now I started with wires with a wired version because it's probably the simplest, safest way to go into sort of a slightly more edgy electronics kind of category that a lot of people don't play in. I'm going to go into Bluetooth uh, next, money permitting, because you know, it's reasonably well established now. Um, I think we're probably going to have a few little issues around reviews and, you know, oh, I can't get it to pair with my phone. Yeah, work it out. Um, so, yeah, and so right now my product pipeline, which is sitting above my desk at home, is basically this is the steps, these are the sort of timelines, and this is, you know, in the next two years I want to have at least 10, and now it's actually blown out to 17. So uh, while that's going on, Linda and I are also working on the new version of the Hypermate. So we had the 2015 version that you saw before, and now uh, I'm working on the 2016 version as well. And that's a pretty, it's not a radical departure, but there's a lot of very big changes that are being introduced to that product. And we're pretty close to finalising the final prototypes, particularly the cups. So that's going to be really exciting. I can't wait to release that as well. I think, I think that's going to go from a four-star Amazon review, hopefully up to a 4.5, which would be really great. Then. Just this month, as I was preparing this speech, I got this email from Amazon. Hello from Amazon. Your listing of one of the colours of your current Hypermate product that's selling on Amazon has been closed. Because 
you've had a return rate of 9% and an unusually high defects compared to other products within the category. So I lost, <coughs> basically I have uh, about 400 units sitting in FBA right now that I could sell, but I, at the moment, I'm actually just holding my horses because I don't want to get my seller account banned. And I think what's going on here is that Amazon is now starting to really <sighs> tighten the noose around anybody that's selling a product that has any sort of defect. Now, I've been selling for, you know, obviously, as you know, for 12 months with, that, with fairly you know, reasonable sort of 10%, 12% return rate. It's a very personal, intimate product that doesn't work for everybody. But it, it changes other people's lives. So it's one of those things, you either love it or you hate it. I get that. I'm okay with that. But Amazon is definitely, what people I think are doing now is that they are shipping products back as a return. Instead of just saying, I don't like it, their marketing is defective. Doesn't block enough sound for me. You know, it's a little bit uncomfortable. It's too big for me. Or it's too small for me. I can't adjust it properly, whatever. So it's, a, it's defective. And this is starting to trip a little filter. And my friend Mick is also with me here this weekend. We've been, we've been working out, we're pretty sure now that the, if, if products are going back as defective, it's around 40% of your entire return rate. So if you've got, if you've got uh, 10 returns coming back and four of them are being, the reason for the return is defective, then you're up for a, a suspension of your listing. Now, product variations are really important here. Now, I've got six colors. So I might have lost my best selling color, but I, the others were still in the game. So I still have got revenue coming through. Then I got another one knocked out, like this week, this guy. So it happened again. Um, so anyway, this is the key takeaways, you can read them there, but basically as you're, you know, if you've got a product, you know, uh, like uh, um, Manuel's product, the first one, you know, if, if let's say the glass starts breaking, well, you sure as hell, if they start going back because you haven't packaged it properly or whatever, it's really important to, you know, obviously fix that problem, but, uh, you know, try and get as many products into the game as quickly as you can of the best quality that you can make, all right? That's the product page there. Uh, just so that, you know, for reference, if you want to see it, we're running at about, you know, we've had about 220 reviews. Oh, by the way, remember when I gave away all those products to the, to the Korean people? Yeah. Well, they were really nice, actually. They all wrote, like, there's about 100 really positive reviews from that. <laughs> Basically, I, you know, a lot of the times you couldn't really understand. Their English wasn't so great, but at least it was very nice of them to leave these lovely reviews. But, of course, then Amazon tightened up its review things. And I went from like, you know, 150 reviews a couple of, like a month after this thing had happened last year going, oh, well, there's a silver lining on every cloud to Amazon pulled them all off. No, not even those. So we've just slowly been kind of gently and, you know, organically. And I use Salesbacker and a few other tools to try and do that. Um, with this too, I didn't do any giveaways to, to, to get it going, to launch it really. Um, it was just because of the keywords, you know, earmuffs for sleeping. That's also one of Amazon's suggested search terms. Again, I pretty much just organically went straight to the top and then really started to take off. Uh, there, I am using Amazon PPC as well, the pay-per-click stuff. Um, and then you get these sort of comments, which I love, which actually just came in the other day on April the 12th. You know, um, what does it say? It says something like, no longer is my hubby and boxer dog exited to another bedroom for snoring. These really help. I still hear them snore, but definitely muffles it. Thank you, hibernate earmuffs. <laughs> that, that's how you save a marriage, you know? I've had, I've had, I had a customer as well, like a couple of weeks ago, said, oh, I just moved in with my future husband, my fiance, uh, and, you know, but he snored like an absolute train. And I was actually thinking of breaking it off. But your product has saved us. Thank you. <laughs> What's the, yeah, that thing? Make meaning, not money. If you, want it, if you make something, a meaningful product, the money will come later. You What's that? You <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't, sorry. I forgot to bring mine, so I had to use Mix, which is in my bag. Anyway, um, anyway so I'm, I think we're just about done here. Uh, I hope it's been reasonably entertaining, but there's a bit of a summary of what's going on. Probably doing around about sort of 35 to 40,000 US dollars a month. You know, I've got the Shopify thing going. We, I've always been online selling, as you know, with e commerce. So that's kind of like, it's always, yeah, Amazon's really nice to have. Uh, and it is actually now representing a much bigger uh, slice of the revenue sort of channel. But, you know, if it all went to the, you know, what, then I could, I could always just, you know, really ramp up on the website as well. Um, you know, AdWords, yeah, probably about seven or eight hundred bucks a month. Um, you know, but the return is obviously a lot higher. I did a bit of Facebook advertising from time to time as well. Um, margins sort of sitting about 50 to 60 percent. You know, obviously, if you're the only person in a category, just write your own check, right? So, um, and then what the other thing I'm doing too at the moment is I'm actually moving the Australian company. I'm closing that down and I'm 
setting up in Hong Kong, you know, it's be, look, obviously it's better tax, but there's also a lot more certainty around revenues. You know, I'm earning in US dollars. Uh, you know, a lot. If there's anybody else here from Australia, other countries, you know, the, um, our, our currency, the Australian dollar, is very volatile against the US dollar. It goes up and down all the time. But so having a, a Hong Kong bank account, which is effectively pegged with the US dollar, supplies are in China. You know, the whole thing makes sense to have your company headquartered in Hong Kong. I'm actually I think I'm going to be talking a little bit with Michael Michelini about the benefits of setting up a business in Hong Kong on Tuesday afternoon just before I fly home back to Australia. Um, yeah, and I actually don't have to work that much anymore. I don't have to work for anybody. Um, you know, there's enough sort of profit for me to pull a little bit of profit out of Hong Kong, bring it back to Australia and, um, and you know, and do okay. And in the next sort of you know, couple of years, hopefully with a lot more of these sort of quite good products, I hope, that, that are selling pretty well. I think the business should go to, you know, one to two million dollars a year with margins around sort of, you know, 30, 40 percent all going well. That, as I say in the classics, is that. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Cool. Great presentation. Thanks a lot. That's okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Where are you? Whoa. Oh, sorry. Manuel. <laughs> oh. no um, one. You talked about looking into Bluetooth products in the future, right? Are you yes. not um, worried about the fees? You know, when you label your uh, Bluetooth products, you need to pay for the Bluetooth licenses and stuff? Uh, I haven't quite got to that point yet. I'm a bit of a just-in-time learner. <laughs> it's yeah, it's 8,000 if you're not a member on the Bluetooth interest group. So if you really consider it, um, yes. that's why I was thinking because you, you were talking about going into the Bluetooth. Yeah, I'd love um, to. Yeah. Check it out, though, because high fees if you private label Bluetooth items. Is that right? Yeah. Hmm. If you stay under a million, it's not as much, but it's still thousands, thousands a year. OK. Is that to use the Bluetooth logo? Or, or to have Bluetooth technology. Wow. Yeah. OK. Good to know. Thanks, guys. This is great. <laughs> I should be asking the questions. <laughs> is there anything else I need to watch out for? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll come and stand next to you and just kind of share it. Uh, so for your earmuffs, you say you have different um, factories that make different parts. Yep. Now, do you ever have um, maybe two factories doing the same part in case one is not able to fulfill in time? Um, mm. Is that something you ever considered? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> just no. That just, well, you know, they... they you know, we, we have a contract, I, I need this, you know, they say, look, we're going to deliver this to you in six weeks or four weeks or whatever, it, you know, however long it takes. Um, and, yeah, you sort of budget for that. One thing I can tell you, though, is that when you're developing anything new, it takes at least two or three times longer than you expect. But, yeah, to answer your question, no, there's a, there is, there's a lot of, yeah, there is risk, I guess. There isn't, I don't actually have, like, a backup plan if one factory just goes out of business halfway through production yet. That's a good idea. <laughs> Pretty laid back about this whole thing, really. So. Okay. Um, uh oh. Yep. How, <laughs> you sound serious. How did you find the keywords uh, that you use to get an A cost of five percent in that competitive of a market? Easy. Okay. Um, I'm actually down to two percent. Two point five. I'll show you on my on my account later if you like. Um, Easy. Okay. So, of course, I mean, I guess all of us here, or well, a lot of us would be listening to Scott Volker, um, you know, the amazing selling, amazing seller podcast. And there's quite a few others that podcast, um, what's the private label podcast with, with uh, Kevin Reiser. So basically, um, I do a lot, I'm very, I'm very audible. I love to listen to podcasts. I'm often just walking the streets, you know, I was, when I lived in Hong Kong, and I would listen to podcasts about how to, do, how to get stuff done. And... One of the things I really wanted to learn about was uh, Amazon PPC. There's a huge amount of information about it. But basically, um, what I do is I run what's called an automatic campaign. So I just say, Amazon, here's my product listing page. This is what I want to advertise. You guys do the rest. And Amazon will just sort of pick out keywords that it thinks that you should rank for, and you will rank. Um, after a while, after about two to three weeks, and you've let the, you know, all the traffic come through on those, on those ads, um, you've got all your conversion data starting to come through on those keywords down at keyword level. Uh, it's at that point that I start pulling out those converting keywords from that list and they go into a manual campaign. 
and I tend to phrase and also have another campaign, I think, which is exact. Um, so I take exactly that keyword and then I set a bid cost on it. Now, it wasn't a surprise for me, but it's basically that list that you saw in AdWords, emails for sleeping, sleeping, emails, they were the keywords that were really going crazy. But Amazon was still ranking me on keywords like sleep mask. And yeah, I got a pretty expensive sleep mask, so the conversion rate was pretty low. So I didn't, I didn't really, so I have a very tight, small set of keywords, but these guys generate lots of money. So I might have spent $7, I think, in like last, $17 last fortnight, and I made $700 in sales, for example. But right now, because of this problem where they're pulling my listings down because of all these defects, um, I've actually turned all my advertising off. Because I don't want to spend money if I'm, you know. This, there's a man at the back, quick. Uh, the, the interesting thing I noticed with the defects is a lot of times to return the items, a customer will put it as a defect just to get a free shipping label. Yeah. Because otherwise, you have to pay for it. And yeah. I think we're all kind of probably guilty of doing that. Yeah. And I'm curious what Amazon will do because it, it becomes a big problem for the seller, when, but yeah. the customer has no idea. Not yet, but I think we're also starting to see that there's a bit of a kind of quality score that's going on with, with buyers. And I'm actually hearing of buyers now being shut, having their accounts, their buying accounts shut down because they're returning too much. They've tripped a filter with Amazon. Um, but the other thing I'm trying to do too is that with the sales backer automated email that I send when someone orders from me, apart from the instructions that I include in the email, it's basically now it just starts off with before you initiate a return, before you leave a negative review, before you contact customer support at Amazon, get in touch with me because I'm going to sort this out for you. By hook or by crook, I'll sort it out. I don't actually say, hey, I'm going to let you have the thing for free and I'm going to refund you in full, you don't have to send it back. But basically, that's where it goes next. They, come, they get in contact, there's any small issue. Hey, listen, I'm, I want to refund you for free. No need to send it back. I can't sell it anyway. I can't sell a used sleep mask. So you hang on to it, gift it, whatever you like. But you know, I'm just all about customer service. And you know, what I'm trying to do at the minute is bring the refund level down. Because uh, it's a lot cheaper for me to just initiate a, like a general adjustment refund. Um, and then it's obviously not a defect and everybody, but, and that, that I th thought was working, but it obviously hasn't worked well enough. So we'll keep trying. Any chances you can reopen the closed listings? I actually reopened the, the red one that you saw in the screenshot before. Uh, I took a gamble. We re I also re completely redid uh, the entire listing. Um, you know, it now says, if you are a side sleeper, probably don't recommend this product because long periods of lying on your side. <laughs> Is it the accent? <laughs> <It's> the accent. <laughs> so actually me and Mick and I were kind of working, uh, my, my, my business partner Mick, we're also, we're, we've got other projects that we work on together, but basically, um, yeah, we were, uh, we were just reworking the copy to try and uh, reset the customer expe expectations to, to you know, um, and yeah, that's, that has definitely had an impact on conversions, but I'm hoping too that it will have an impact on customer expectations and therefore, you know, potential return issues down the track as well. But have you opened it with Amazon's agreement on this or you just... No, you, you have, in the email it basically says you can relist at any time uh, provided that, you know, but... The risk is that this continues to happen. Amazon shuts down a listing. I then bring it back again, hoping that I've fixed it. Uh, and then this, you know, we have a few of these. There's a very strong risk, and this is a bit I'm really worried about, is that Amazon could actually suspend my seller account. That's the ultimate, really, where I don't want to go. So because of all the new products that I've got coming, it's kind of like, well, do I take a hit now, get rid of the stock out of the FBA warehouse, stop paying for a storage and all the rest of it? and you know, basically have nothing for sale until I release this next product um, you know, and the other subsequent products, which will probably have a lot less defect rate because, I mean, we know that these, the, you know, these speakers are definitely going to be incredibly reliable. They've got Kevlar cables and, you know, they're, I've spared no expense on the next product. None. Thank you. It's all right. Okay, let's give you a big round of applause for Chris Honest. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, guys.